Amazing. Okay, ladies, good morning. Welcome to the first of two Girls Collective <laughs> events. So this is all about female empowerment. This is all about making you ladies know, feel more empowered that you guys can do anything that you guys want to do at all. Of course, society wants to tell us that women should be at a certain level. On top of that, if you're if you don't fit into the normal like idea of perfection, you again you're already hindered to what you can do. But we're here to tell you guys that those boxes are just a social construct. It doesn't mean that they're set in stone and they shouldn't determine what you guys want to go on and do. There's certain sort of careers, for example, architecture and even going to the army and even directing and all that kind of stuff. A lot of these are masculine sort of careers. They're male dominated. It tends to be like, oh yeah, the guy's doing that. As the man, they're going to be the provider. We're just going to be at home cooking and cleaning. But no, <laughs> that's not what we're going to do. Unless you want to do that, but don't ever feel like you're forced to do that. So today is going to be all about listening to these amazing inspirational women that we've got for you guys today and just being inspired by their stories and what they're doing now because they're all doing amazing things and also it's going to show you that even though you come from different backgrounds you're all completely different people it doesn't mean that you can't all go on to do the same things in life or go on to do great different things as well we all have our own stories and we all have our own individual journeys and no matter what age you end up doing something at what time you do something at it's all okay and you see from these three ladies that they are also different, but they're all so successful. And success comes in different forms and success comes in different colors and different heights, different everything. And as long as you're happy, you're successful in my eyes. So without further ado, we'll go on to our first speaker and I'll let her introduce herself and get onto that. So round of applause. <laughs> Okay, hi guys, my name is Aroni. Um, I've just come to share a little bit about myself today and what I do, and hopefully what I want to do in the future as well, just so that you guys can know my journey and feel encouraged today with the empowerment um, vibe that's going on here. I really, really love um, you know, seeing women encouraged and seeing women do, you know, be encouraged to reach their full potential, achieve any goals that they want to achieve career-wise, personally, health-wise. So um, hopefully my little talk at the beginning will help you guys with that. And um, I'm going to tell you also about my brand because I set up a brand last year, um, my own business, um, hand making jewellery. And then I'm just going to give you guys the opportunity to just make some jewellery today. And um, yeah, you can keep it, you can take it with you or you can leave it here, it's up to you. But um, yeah, just wanted to share with you guys my story. So um, I was, so I went to school. I've lived, that's fine. <laughs> I went to school, I've lived in Sheffield the majority of my life. Um, I, after school, I went to sixth form. Uh, Sheffield High sixth form up the road and then after sixth form I went to university I went to Lincoln Uni and um, it was okay there it was a bit different because I had been to um, an all-girls school an all-girls sixth form and then I just went to like an environment where it was a bit mixed so it was a kind of like um, I was used to just being around girls or been in like an educational setting with only girls um, but it was fine. I went there for three years and I studied psychology and counselling. So my hope was to be a psychotherapist and work with young people like with mental health issues and um, families. Yeah, so I wanted to work with young people and families with mental health issues. And um, that's why I studied psychology and counselling. Um, I finished my degree in 2019. And then I started working in for a company in London, but it was remote work. So I was traveling a little bit around um, around England and I was um, doing a lot of computer work. I was doing psychology research. So we were just um, basically collecting research about young people and the effects of like mental health um, on their school life, their home life, and um, just helping collect the research so that we could um, help the government maybe write policies so that they could make 
um, for example, like the school environment, a bit more mental health friendly, or um, set up little activities like, like you're doing today, just for you to come and unwind and just feel as though like you have a place to be, maybe like on a Saturday morning or a Saturday um, afternoon. So um, I was doing that from 2019 until 2020, obviously COVID hit, and I did actually lose my job. So I was feeling a bit, um, a bit lost, I would say. But it was, it was in a, it was in a weird time because everybody was like, you know, they weren't really going to school, nobody was really going to college, no one was going to work. So it kind of felt a bit weird being indoors, um, not really doing anything. And so um, I decided to set up my own brand in all of that free time. And um, it was slightly before that that I decided. So I decided in January that I wanted to set up my own brand or maybe like in December time. And I wanted to make jewelry. Um, initially, I only wanted to make waist beads. So it's just beads that go around your waist. And um, it was just because when I was traveling, because I used to travel a lot just with my friends, I just wanted to, um, when I was going on the beach and stuff, I just wanted beads that would match my outfits and things like that. And I was looking for a brand in England that would do the beads that I wanted, like specific colors, specific designs. And I couldn't find any in England. Like a lot of them were abroad or uh, the shipping was just so expensive. And so I thought if I can't find it here or I can't like, I couldn't find what I wanted here, I decided to make my own brand or make my own business. Um, making and selling beads. Um, I've now branched out, so I did start with just waist beads, but I've now branched out to um, anklets and bracelets. And some people are now inquiring about me doing like thigh beads. So you just put like the beads around here, you know, in summertime. Um, so I will be doing like expanding and doing more things, hopefully within the next few um, months. But, um, yeah, so I started my brand in May, so it's been a year, May 2020, and I I basically started with very little money because I'd, lo I'd lost my job or I'd stopped working um, for like um, the, the hours that they'd give me. They cut down my hours and I was, you know, struggling a little bit, so I had to design and make my website myself. And I've never been any kind of website builder. I didn't know how to do, I knew how to obviously, you know, work social media and kind of set up Instagram and stuff like that. But um, the website was really hard. I had to take my own pictures. I became so many things. I never thought that I could become like, um, I did administration. I was a photographer for my brand. I had to do like modeling for my own brand. And it was just like seeing myself or like fulfilling like my potential and just doing things that I never thought that I would be like capable of doing by myself. But kind of going into lockdown, you know, it, it, it forced me to focus on you know, bettering myself professionally and bettering myself personally. So, um, yeah, I did all of my website, I did all of my social media, so you know, Facebook, Instagram, marketing, um, and all of this kind of thing. I actually went to get the beads myself, so the beads do come from Africa, and I wanted them to be really specific, so I actually did go and get the beads myself. I traveled to, um, I traveled to Africa, I went to Ghana, and I, um, the day I landed, the two days after was when we went into national lockdown in March. So I literally just made it back into England and I just started beading. I started making my beads straight away. And then, um, yes, yeah, so I came back in March and then I launched in May of last year. Um, so yeah, I make, I just bought some now to, I mean, some today to show, but I make, I make all of them like handmade and I have on my website, I basically let people choose exactly what colors they want and what color pattern they would like them to do it in. And because these um, these are part of my, um, because they're part of my brand and they're part of my ethos, I wanted to basically 
use the beads to encourage confidence, to make people just feel a little bit better about themselves, you know, have like an accessory, like for me definitely when I was on holiday and I could just like have my matching beads with my outfit or I might just have like an all white outfit and I can just put my beads on. Um, I just feel a little bit more confident, you know, I just feel a little bit better about myself and um, I feel really well accessorized. And that's what I was hoping for when I launched my brand, just to give other, other people the opportunity to um, wear the beads and just feel um, more confident and just a bit more like happier, I guess, because I definitely felt more happier. Um, I also decided to launch a like flag collection. So if anyone is from like a particular country all over the world, because I do ship internationally, they were able to um, let me know on my website what like country flag they want. All of these flags around here are probably, I've probably done a few of these as well. Like people have been ordering from so many places, uh, Belgium, to Belgium, the Philippines, um, many places in Africa. There's just been so many, so many countries that people have been ordering. So this one is Jamaica. And this one is, I think it's, um, this one was Afghanistan. Yeah, um, I had an order from, maybe not from the countries, but people would want to represent where they're from, for example, and just like represent their country. So they asked me to make the beads in like the, the country, uh, the colors of their flags. Um, yeah, so that's what I've been doing for the last year. Um, I think that it has really been encouraging. I've just been so overwhelmed with like the orders I've received, the amount of support from people that I don't know, the amount of support that I get from people like um, internationally. Um, Cause I joined, I went on to TikTok and I decided to make a video to show, show my beads. And um, my video actually went viral and then it spread to like America and just the amount of support that I just got from people around the world has just been so inspiring. Like if anyone would want to start their own brand or is interested in starting their own business or something like that, I would just definitely encourage it because you don't know your own potential until you do something that's maybe a little bit scary a little bit like uncomfortable at first um because i definitely kept myself to myself at the beginning um like during school i was just everything was just uh, everyone told me what to do like during school they say you know you go to this lesson at this time you finish school at this time you go home and then you know you do what you want with the weekend and then you go back to school you go to uni you go to this class and so just been able to do something that was my own starting from the beginning and something that I was passionate about, something that I was interested in. Um, it's just been so helpful for me. It's been really, really um, inspiring. And I just hope that, I, well, I know that I'll be able to do this for many, many years. I can't wait to see my brand expand and go into different um, countries and, you know, just really take it to the next level and um, yeah, to do more with my brand. So I did actually bring all of my, well, majority of my beads with me, just like for you guys to maybe make your own beads. You don't have to make waist beads. I, I do, obviously, I've made some waist beads just to um, to show, but you just basically like take a measurement. I bought my, um, my measuring tape. Like you take a measurement of where you want it to fall. Some people like their waist beads falling like quite high. Some people like them to fall like um, around their stomach. It doesn't really matter like where you want it to fall. Or um, if you'd like to make an anklet today or a bracelet just to take with you or to leave leave here just for something to to do. Um, I would really love to you know show you guys how to do it, teach you guys, and just give you something to take away from the session or something to take away just to remind you of, you know, my brand and yeah. So, what are some of the difficulties you face or trying to establish yourself as a woman in an industry where you're like starting up your own business and you're trying to branch out, you're trying to basically establish yourself? Um, the main problems that I faced was 
surrounding COVID because I felt like my the help that I could get was suddenly cut off. I had to do a lot of things like independently. I had no supervision. I had no. I was just used to been in an education setting where you have like a teacher you can go to, a supervisor that you can go to, someone you can just turn to like, I'm struggling with this, I don't know how I'm gonna be able to work it out. Whereas I just went onto the internet, you know, I was typing out how to set up my own brand, how to attract this audience, you know, the kind of things that I would want to um, help my brand grow. And then basically like taking it upon myself to write my own business plan and have people kind of um, take me seriously when it wasn't really something that, because it's not really to do with my degree, for example. So um, having people take me seriously and doing things very independently, I think that would be my, my biggest um, challenge. It would be doing everything so independently and just having to create a brand from scratch by yourself and everything's relying on you. If one thing in the brand doesn't work, um, there's no one that I can turn to and I can say like, oh, is it okay if you help me with this? Or there's no one to blame apart from myself. So it's making sure everything goes in like accordance with each other. Everything's working in the same way. And um, yeah, I think that would be like my biggest challenge. Nice. And ladies, if you have any questions at all, don't hesitate to ask you when we do that activity as well. Yeah, any other questions? What's the name of your brand? Uh, my brand is called Isosa Beads. It's actually my middle name. My middle name is um, Isosa. And I was thinking how to make my brand personal to me. I was thinking about our name for so long. Um, how to make my brand personal to me. Something that's kind of like a legacy. Something that I can like be proud of. So I did name it after myself, like my middle name. And so it's always going to be, I feel like, personal to me and it's always going to be um my brand i've got actually like um, i'll show you guys after but i've actually got my business cards here and it's like a little um my logo is just like a, a well it's meant to be kind of representative of me but um she's wearing a swimsuit and she's just wearing the beads and so um yeah i designed the logo myself i designed like everything myself all of the cards so yeah, that's the name of my brand. Any other questions? No. Um, do you guys want to make some um waist beads or bracelets or anklets? I've got an anklet on right now. It's really easy to make. Um, I just made a plain white one, and um, I think I've got some waist beads on. But I'm just wearing a bit too much. Um, yeah, so. If you would like to, um, I could hand out some beads for you guys to make some now. Um, I'll hand out the strings. Um, yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna put myself on a timer so that I can keep track of what I'm talking about. So I'm Ursula, Ursula Myrie. I'm the founder and CEO of Adira. Adira is a survivor-led mental health and well-being service that specifically supports black people with mental health issues. That doesn't mean nobody you know, else can't come to us, but we do specifically support black people with mental health issues for the simple reason that in the black community, we don't believe in mental health. Behind closed doors, we will say that's a white man's problem. It doesn't exist for us. But yet still, we are overpopulating the psychiatric wards. For every white person on a psychiatric ward, there are seven black people. So there is a disconnect somewhere, because we're saying, well, I don't believe in it. Because in the black community, mental health is seen as voodoo, witchcraft, juju, evil eye, black magic, it's not mental health. You can't come to a black person, even if they're running the streets of Sheffield naked because they've had a psychiatric break and say to them, you know, we think you've got mental health issues because they will tell you it doesn't exist for us. So Adira, I set up Adira eight years ago and it's been going eight years on and off. 
the first three years we, we um, were specifically focused on women, supporting women. And what I did was I went into the community, the poorest community I could find in Sheffield, which is Page Hall, Fairvale. And I said to them, what is it that you need? What is it that you need from us? Do you live in Fairvale? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah. No, this was eight years ago, so you're not wrong. Okay, we're not yeah. wrong. Because they just seem to the government just seems to have taken a lot of Roma Slovaks and just oh dumped God, them yeah. in there. And what's yeah. happened is all the people who were born and raised and you know raised their families there have just moved out, you know, because the certain Slovaks they live a certain way, <laughs> which is not conducive to, to our lifestyle. So we went into there, and what I didn't do was go in there and say to the community, okay, so this is how we're gonna fix you. Um, we're gonna do this, and this service we're offering, and no, I said to them, what do you need? Two words kept coming up every time. Who can tell me what those two words were in terms of what the community said they need? What do you think those two words were? Support? Nope. Yes, but what kind of support? Mental health support. No. Benefits or something. Benefits or something. Close. Food and clothes. Those are the two words. Oh my god, that's actually my phone. How embarrassing. Those are the two words that kept coming up. Food and clothes. Because with mental health, even, you know, just general, people don't like to admit that they have mental health issues. So even if they're alcoholic, or they're a wife beater, or they're the, the one being abused, they're not gonna say to you, oh, I need help because my husband is beating me. They're not gonna say to you, oh, I need help because my child is doing drugs. They're gonna say to you, I need food, and I need clothes. And that is the door into, into their lives. So we set up a, a food bank, and we set up a clothing bank. Now the clothing bank was where we had the community donate, all over Sheffield they donated clothes, shoes, handbags, pots, pans, bedding, and people would come to the clothing bank and we'd sell it very, very cheap because this is a community that doesn't have money. So what we found was people were donating designer clothes, literally with the label still on them. So you'd get an Armani top for like three pound, brand new, still with the label on, because you can't be selling the Armani top for a hundred pounds for a community that's on benefits. You know, they can't afford it. So that's what we were doing. And people were like, well, okay, so you're meeting the physical need because you're giving them the food and you're giving them the clothes. What's that got to do with their mental health? But I tell you what would happen. A woman would come into the clothing bank and she'd be, this is the clothes rail. Mm -hmm. And she'd be talking to me and I'm saying, oh, you know, what size clothes do you want? And she'd be going, mm -hmm. oh, this looks like it'll fit me. Oh, this looks not like it might. Oh, do you know, um, my husband beats me all the time. And she's talking to me, but she's not looking at me. She's looking at the clothes rail. She's going through the clothes and we're having that conversation. And, my, and I don't react to what she just said. I just like, oh my God. Yeah, this looks like it'd fit you. So he beats you, does he? How often does he, does he do that? And we have a conversation by the clothes rail. All right? Or they're coming for a coffee. And while they're drinking that coffee, they'll be telling you that their, their son is doing this and their daughter is doing that. And you hear the most horrific stories whilst they're going through the clothes rail, whilst they're going through. And it's then when, after six weeks of them coming and she comes every week and she, sometimes these women would come or these men would come and they wouldn't even buy anything. They'd come and we'd go through the motion, going through the clothes rail or looking through some curtains or some clothes. And while we're looking, yap, yap, yap. And after a few weeks of me just listening and okay, and talk, they say, do you know what? I think I'm ready now. I think I'm ready to leave my husband because I don't want him beating me anymore. And that was when I would say, okay, well, I know of a refuge or I know somewhere you can go, that's a safe place to go. And that was the door in to mental health. And that is what Adira does. With the black community, you can't come straight on and say, okay, this is how we're gonna fix your mental health. Because first of all, you don't look like me. You're not black. So unless you're black, you don't understand my culture, my history, my faith, my religion, all these things that are tied into my mental health. And secondly, I don't believe in mental health. So how are you going to help me? So with the, a diary is set up like carrot and donkey <laughs> with the black community. You wave a donkey, in front, a carrot in front of a donkey and it will always come. It has to be like that with the black community. You've just got to have the right carrot, and a diet is the right carrot because we, the things that we put on around mental health and the things that we do for mental health, it's almost like when you were 
very, very young kids and your mum said, right, you've got to take your medicine and you knew that medicine was disgusting. And so what I would do when my kids were little, if it was a tablet, I would hide it in their food or I would wrap it in a sweet and give it to them because they didn't realise that the medicine was in there. That's what a diuret is. It's basically a giant pill for the black community. So a lot of the services we have, people look and think, well, I don't understand if you're a mental health organisation, why you're doing this project? Because what's that got to do with mental health? Some of the projects we do, we have a women, black women only support group that meets once a month where black women come to pour their pain and trauma because the biggest complaint that we have from black women, black people, black men, what do you think the biggest complaint is? Yeah, yeah, anybody else? What do you think the biggest complaint is? Especially if you think about what's happening now in terms of the climate, George Floyd, Black Lives Matter, what do you think the biggest complaint is from the black community? Racism, discrimination, bias, all these things affect the black community, all these things affect our mental health. So I set up a Daira to be the bridge. I call it a drawbridge because it's a bridge that when I see certain people coming, <laughs> I pull it up because I don't want them coming in and getting involved in my organization. But it's a bridge between the statutory services and the black community. Because the black community will argue that, oh, you know, white people, racism, we don't want them involved with us, we don't want them doing anything with us. The white statutory services will accuse us of being difficult to engage. Um, we, we segregate ourselves. So we, the direct is the bridge between these two communities. So the statutory services will come to us and say, right, I've got a black woman, she's got mental health issues, whether it's housing problems or benefit problems, we help her with that. We have a young people support group. Um, that's, we have about 50 young black kids in the community that we support. Um, they call me Mama Ursula, so just basically a sign of respect. So everything is Mama Ursula, Mama all day long, Mama Ursula. Mm -hmm. And when I do big events, I always get them to come and volunteer. And people say to me, how do you get so many young kids to volunteer for it? And I ask them the question, what do you do for them? Because we as adults, we want you young people to do this and do that and tell you, oh, volunteer. Oh, give your time for free. Oh, you're helping your community. And don't get me wrong, I'm all for that. I'm all for, you know, getting young people into volunteering and helping and, you know, benefiting their community. But also value young people. Put a price on it. Put a price on their time. Put a price on them coming and giving their time to you as an organisation or, or as, a, as a business. So as a Daira, we have the Black Women Only Support Group that meets once a month. Last year during lockdown, um, for years and years and years, I was saying to predominantly white statutory services, there is a link between black hair and black mental health, a massive link. Imagine having bubble gum in your hair and you're trying to pull it out. It is virtually impossible once it's in there to get it out. That's how linked black hair is to black mental health. And for years I was saying to statutory services, there is a link, you need to do something. Nobody was listening. And when lockdown happened, the biggest complaint we got from service users was, Ursula, um, I can't get hold of the hairdresser because uh, she's got her own problems with COVID. I can't get hold of the barber. He's got his own problems with COVID, but I don't know what, what shampoo to use in my hair because the hairdresser normally does that. I don't know what comb or brush to, to use in my hair. The hairdresser deals with that. When lockdown was lifted, the complaint then became, okay, so the barber's is open, the salon is open, but, oh, my husband died during COVID and he was the main breadwinner. My wife died, she was the main breadwinner. Or I've got uh, kids' school shoes to pay for, so I can't do my hair. Now, who knows the importance of, can you see the link, let me ask you, between black hair and black mental health? What do you think the link is between black hair and black mental health? Have you ever heard of such a thing, a link between black hair and black mental health? Well, the hair's on the head, the mental health's on the brain. Mm -hmm. But why is the hair so important for us in the black community in terms of the link with our mental health? Like a history. Yes. 
the history behind it. I could go all the way back to before Adam and Eve, but I won't. I will go just back to slavery. During slavery, what a lot of people don't know is that black hair saved us from slavery. You know cornrows mm -hmm. or cane rows, what black people, those stars that black people wear? During the days of slavery, if you were on the cornfield, your hair was done in cornrows. If you were on the cane field, your hair was done in cane rows. Now, it wasn't just, oh, I'm doing a really nice style here, really nice cane row on my head. The cane rows was literally a map. It was a map. It was designed in a map on the person's head to let the other slave know this is the route to the Underground Railroad. And the Underground Railroad is what the slaves used to escape. And what the mothers used to do was to put grains and rice in the corn rows. So on the journey, they would untie their hair, wash the rice, wash the grain, and feed their children. Now that's our history of our hair, and that's why it's so tied into our mental health. So last year, one of the projects Adira launched was the Sheffield's first, it was described as historic, black hair care project. And the black hair care project basically gives black people with mental health issues the opportunity to get their hair done for free. Now, one of the main reasons we offered it for free was because who can guess how much, because when my, my hair is, this is my hair, I bought this. But when it's out in its natural state, it's a massive afro. And it's not like your hair. It doesn't just, I can't just wake up, tie it in a bun and go because it just goes poof. So, and if it rains, it shrivels up like that. Our hair doesn't do well with the elements. That's why we can't have our natural hair out all year round because I would be bald, literally bald, because my hair would fall out and break. Because in this country, heat damages our hair. So does the wind, so does the rain. So we put it into these what we call protective styles to protect it from the elements. Who can tell me how much a style like this, how much you think a style like this costs to get done? 100 pounds. Anybody else? Just a guess. Thousand. A thousand, dear God. <laughs> Nobody be getting their hair done. Definitely not, you're very close, very close. It really depends. <laughs> on the style. For a style like this, you need about five packs of hair. Each hair costs about five pounds a pack. So for my head, because my head is quite big, I need five packs, that's 30 pounds. And then the hairdresser, depending, for length like this, it's about 60 pounds. Some black women have their hair down to here, and if they wanna be extra, they have it down to their ankle. Yeah. So you can be charged anything between 60 and 180 pounds to get your hair done every six to eight weeks. Now imagine you're a mother, so you've got to get your hair done. You've got two daughters, they've got to get their hair done. And you've got two sons who need to go to the barbers. They've got to get their hair done. You look, that's some serious money. And if you're on low income or you're on benefits, how are you going to afford that? And for us, it's not a case of, oh, let me go to the hairdresser because I want to look good. I'm going out tonight. It's not vanity for us. It's necessity, as I said, if we don't do these styles, our hair breaks. So imagine as a mother, you're thinking, okay, um, do my hair or pay that bill. Do my hair or buy my son that school shoes. Do my hair or pay for my daughter's university. Mm, okay, so this hand wins because most important, you're thinking as a mother, pay the bills. But over here, this is what's happening to the person's mental health. It's going in the toilet because they can't get their hair done. And our hair, our, our religion teaches us that our hair is our crown. That's one of the projects we offered. When lockdown happened, everybody was focused on now, now, now. Oh my God, we're going into lockdown. Um, what do we do? I was the only person saying to everybody because I think ahead. What about Christmas? What about Christmas? Is anybody thinking about Christmas? Because when lockdown hit, people were dying quickly, quickly, quickly by the numbers. And it was a case of, okay, so what happens when Christmas comes and these people have lost their jobs or the husband's lost his job or the wife or they've lost their benefits or they don't have enough money? They're going to be eating toast on Christmas Day. That was when we decided to do a Christmas hamper. So we did one last year and the Christmas hamper, I said, I want to see in that Christmas hamper, not food, what you'd see at a food bank, which is tinned rice pudding or uh, tinned steak. I wanted in the hamper things that I was gonna eat on Christmas day. So I wanted to see a frozen chicken, roast potato, Yorkshire pudding, 
veg, uh, apple crumble, custard, everything that you see on a table on Christmas Day, we made sure was in that hamper. And we gave out 500 hampers to 500 families so that they wouldn't have to eat toast on Christmas Day. And we were oversubscribed for those hampers. We only had 500 and had over 1,000 requests for the hampers. And that was from Rotherham, Barnsley, Sheffield, and Doncaster. Up to Christmas Eve, 9 o'clock at night, I was still delivering hampers in, in Barnsley. That's some of the things, some of the projects that Adira does as an organization. There are seven of us on the committee. As I said, I am the, the CEO in general dog's body because one of the things about being a CEO, it's a nice title. Everybody wants to be CEO because it sounds so good. But being a CEO means cleaning the toilets, putting out chairs before people come. It's not about sitting in a big office with a big laptop and being the great I am. There's more to being a CEO than that. Last year, we got £45,000 in funding to do to deliver some of the projects that we, we have as a DIRA. There are seven of us on the, the committee, and we're looking to grow that committee. We do other projects as well where we go into people's homes um, and sit and talk with them. When lockdown happened, we all went online. I hate online, <laughs> anything online. I'm just not, I, you know, your generation are so used to all that, but my generation, we're more face-to-face. -face. So when lockdown happened and we went online, all the adults were like, uh-uh, no, I, I, I can't do that, Estee. I've got to see you. I've got to see your face. I need to see you. I'm used to seeing you. So because of COVID and everything, and we couldn't go into people's houses, we did something called drive-through therapy. And drive-through therapy basically meant I would drive to your house, uh, sit in my car in front of your house, you sit on your doorstep, and we slag off the prime minister for two hours. And that's your therapy. But you got to see my face. It's not on Zoom. You saw my face, and then I would just drive to the next house and the next house, or we'd go to the park, and you sit on that bench, I sit over here, and we put the world to rights for two hours. Because when it comes to, to black mental health, you've got to think outside of the box and think of things that other people won't think of, which is why I showed you the Afrobeats dance class. Afrobeats is big right now in terms of the music scene. Everybody's coming out of lockdown with a couple more pounds than they had before they went in. So everybody's looking to lose the lockdown weight. So that was why we got funding to do the Afrobeats dance classes. We've done um, finance classes for young people because one of the things that young people don't think about is, okay, so I'm only 18, I'm only 20. I don't need to be thinking about a pension at 20. I don't need to be thinking about a mortgage at 20, but you do. Because I promise you, I swear to God, I was two yesterday. I don't know how I got to be 48. I blinked and I was 48. <laughs> if you look at your lives now, you'd think to yourself, couple, you were in nursery a couple of days ago. Where has the time gone between when you were in nursery playing with your, you know, your little friends in the toddler play, play pit to now? You've blinked and you're here. So don't take it for granted that, oh, um, you know, I'm still young, so I've got time to, you know, I'll wait till I'm 30 and then I'll start saving for a pension. I'll wait until I'm 45, then I'll start saving for this. Nothing is guaranteed. So we ran a class for um, young people to teach them how to manage money, how to start saving from now. Start putting money aside from now. These are some of the projects that Adira as an organization offers. Um, this is something that I wanted to do with you. If you all could take a pen from your desks, please, and I really want your help with this. If you could be very, very honest, no filter. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no filter. <laughs> we're, we're very honest people. Yes, thank you. Thank you. So, totally yes. Feel free to put a couple of swears on there. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Don't tell us, because we're going to go berserk now. Good. That's what I want. Okay. okay. If you could be honest uh, and say to adults who you feel, do you know what? My parents, my, my boss, my uni um, lecturer, these people don't understand me. They don't understand what I deal with as a young person. They don't understand what I go through. If I could, because I personally don't swear, the worst I will say is crap, because okay. I just don't swear. <laughs> I'm just not capable of swearing. But I can make a grown man cry. 
You push me. I'm telling you, I've got a mouth on me. I can make a grown man cry, but I just don't swear. But if you could just say, do you know what? I wish grown-ups, for the love of God, knew this about me. This is what I struggle with as a young person, whether it's um, mental health, whether it's, oh, I'm LGBT and I'm treated differently because of it, whether it's because I'm black or because I'm Asian or because I'm too light, I'm too dark, I'm too fat, I'm too skinny. These are the things that I'm carrying. These are the things that I'm dealing with. And I'm tired of my parents and my lecturers saying, get on with it, get over it. So what, grow up. If you could just let rip and say, this is what I'm effing dealing with. Put it down on the paper, please. It can be one word, one sentence. What is it that if you could tell your parents without getting into trouble, and say, actually, Dad, this is what I'm effing thinking of, and this is what I think about you, and this is what I'm carrying. You just don't get it. What would you say? What would you tell them? She can't think of anything. I can't think of anything. It depends who I'm telling it. Yeah, but that's it. Everybody. This is encompassing everybody. Your best friend, your neighbor, your lecturer at school, your mom, your dad. Yeah. Like, 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 yeah. 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 Like, yeah.
Your cousin. Oh my god. Oh, so much worse than you. Oh, your cousin has grown taller. How can you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, that one. Did you say that? Oh, for the love of God. Your, your, your cousin has a drop. My cousin's 18. I'm about three. What's your point? I don't get it. My cousin's getting married today and she's 19. I know for a fact when I go down, she'll be like, oh, so who's your guy then? So who, I know who, for a fact. Yeah, you're going to do that. I want to ask. This is my brother's nickel. Oh, yeah. I know, 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 <laughs> no, me neither. I read like two paragraphs on the same one. <laughs> Men are treated as more superior. Dude. Oh, don't be What is it about men? You have a penis, that's it. Men are trash. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, there are no men here. Uh, typical, typical. So is it you saying men are trash or is it your parents saying no, men are I'm trash? Saying, this I, is I, two I, separate ones. Okay. <laughs> I'm saying men are trash because they favoured Islam. Yeah. 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 People from an Asian household. Yes, yes. favouritism. That's a good one. Let me write that one. Why do men? That's my cousin. He's a male. He's the same age as me. He literally sits down. My brother's like, oh, you help out, do all this. And like, what? My mum's like, your brother's gonna buy the house and then yeah. he's gonna do this, this, and this. I'm like, mummy's 20, he's never had a job. <laughs> <laughs> and then when I was 16, she was like, why haven't you got a job yet? 16. I was married yet. And this is the same, and this is the same mum who asks, why don't you have a job? And then when you ask, hey, can I have a job? Like, what do you need a job for? You've got to work here. But so so you can't win, basically. <laughs> you be There's more. Are you guys ready to stick yours on? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. They don't really <laughs> stick it to me. Keep them on there. I'm not really doing it. Oh, shit. Oh, shit. Oh, shit. Oh, shit. Oh, shit. Oh, this was all in the house of six months. Oh, wow. Oh, how good it is. It's good, isn't it? I love it. The ones that I get up there are all good. It's just like one. I'm bringing them up every day. The two more. Yeah, done. I'll get ready to go It's just my diet, I need a little bit of help. <laughs> 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 I swear, I love that one. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to have to use some zoom tags if they're not. Yeah, yeah, they're not doing Like zoom, yeah. 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 Like Men say to get me over. I didn't ask to be here. Not allowed to move out because I'm a female. Girls don't like my clothes. I mean, I'm uncertain about the future and that should be okay. Unfortunately, it's not for some parents. Oh. Double standards, most definitely. It's just particularly in Asian. Oh, yes, yeah, particularly in Asian households. Men are. Probably not just in the just women. Men are trash. I am not 12 anymore. Let me grow. Race. 
colorism, feeling trapped, government, oh my God, yes, mental health, lack of understanding, workload, social life, friends, family, church, culture, yeah. community, balance, juggling, <laughs> budgeting, eee, we won't touch on that one. <laughs> <laughs> I don't feel connected with my heritage, which makes it harder for me to find my place in the world. Amen, Joe. Uh, being treated different for being lesbian. You don't even want to talk about LGBT in the black community. Oh, Jesus oh, Christ. Yeah. <laughs> no, I swear. Lack of independence, culture. I used to cry about worrying to tell people that I am bisexual. Body shaming. Now, I want you to imagine that all these are bricks. All these, all these statements, all these words, I want you to imagine that they're bricks, yeah? And they're bricks in a massive backpack. And this is what you all carry on your backs oh. every day. And you're not allowed to take the backpack off. And I'm telling you, you've got to sleep in that backpack with the bricks in it. You've got to eat in that backpack. You've got to shower. You've got to bath in that backpack. You've got to go to college, uni, work in that backpack. If you're going out with your girls to clubs, take the backpack with you. You cannot take this off. How would that make you feel? Not <laughs> But the long and short of it is, you are. You, it's just not a physical backpack that people can see with bricks in it, but you're carrying all of this every day as young people, people of color, white people, Asian, every day you're carrying all of these things. And when your parents, your, your, your teachers, your the adults in the world like us are saying to you, you know, oh, Lose weight, put on weight, come in earlier. Why did you come in so early? It's almost like somebody taking bricks out but putting more in and then they're taking it and you think, what are you doing? So you're at that place where you're, you're, you're struggling as young people because you're feeling, well, I don't know who I am. I don't know my place in society. Is it okay for me to be gay? Is it not okay for me to be to be gay? Is it okay for me to be black? Is it okay for me to like boys? Is it okay for me to like girls? Is it okay for me to be a girl that dresses as a boy? Is it okay for me to be a boy that dresses as a girl? More bricks and you're carrying that. But if I was to say to you, okay, you're carrying all that and that's not even half of the things that you're carrying. This isn't even half of the things. If you had time to sort of spend the whole day and really sit down and think, what do I deal with on a daily basis as a young person? Somebody up there put government. I felt like when lockdown happened, all students, all young people were just forgotten about. You know, nobody said, well, how are students coping with this? How are young people coping? What about, about their mental health? They used to been outside and used to hanging out with their friends and now they're locked up. Is anybody thinking about that? Is anybody asking them how they feel? Does anybody care? And this is your government. And you're carrying that every single day. And I feel like sometimes we as parents, we think, well, you know what? Um, you're saying, oh, but I'm, I, I'm struggling with my friend at school because she, she went and, and stole my boyfriend. And we're like, really? That's, that's your biggest worry in the world, that your best friend stole your boyfriend. When I'm, I, I'm worried about how I'm going to pay the mortgage. And I'm worried about, but does that mean that your worry about your boyfriend is any less? than your parents, but it's difficult as parent and child to see each other's point of view because as parents, we're thinking my generation was the generation that literally sucked it up. Yeah, and especially if you're black, we teach our children from the womb. Portray the image of the strong black man and the strong black woman at any cost. Don't let white people see you cry. Don't let white people see you break. Even if it means you end up in the psychiatric, what I call the PCP, the psychiatric ward, the prison or the cemetery. So what? As long as you portray that image as the strong black man and the strong black woman, because that's what the media portrays. But we then pass that on to our children. So when our children come home and say, oh, mommy, I'm being bullied at school, or mommy, the teachers um, told me off for something that wasn't my fault. Instead of saying to the child, okay, what's going, suck it up. 
I've got bigger things on my plate. I've got more important things to be thinking about than your problems and your issues. So a diary is almost like a, a mediator for families because we work with families. I'll give you an example. Um, last year, I was the year before, before lockdown, two months before lockdown, I got a call three o'clock in the morning from two of my young people. When I say young people, they were, I think, 19 and 22 at the time, living at home with a mum who has serious mental health issues, is a raging alcoholic, she's on antidepressants, and she has psychotic breaks from time, psychotic breaks from time to time. And they called me at three in the morning because the mum had a psychotic break and tried to strangle both of them. I had to jump in, <laughs> jump in my car, in my pajamas, drove to the, to the house. By the time I caught their mum was missing, couldn't find her, so I had to get the police to be looking for her while I was supporting the children. The mum was brought to the police station. She stayed there overnight. The kids said, we don't want to press charges because our mum doesn't need to be locked up in prison. She needs psychiatric help. She needs psychiatric care. But in their culture, you don't do mental health. You don't do locking up. You don't do, we pretend it's, it's not happening. So when the, the police brought the mum back the next morning, 9, 10 o'clock in the morning, the dad came, he doesn't live there anymore, he's married to a new wife, now he came and the first thing he said to his children when he walked into the house, kneel down and apologize to your mother for having her locked up overnight. And they were like, but that, these are quite light complexion girls so you could still see the mother's fingerprints around their neck and they were told to kneel down and apologize to their mother. Not, you know, oh my God, I'm so sorry your mom did this to you. And, you know, let's talk about your mom's mental health. Their culture, kneel down and apologize. And they said, we're not doing it. We're not, because the thing is, if you raise your child here, they're raised with the westernized culture. They understand that, okay then, so me kneeling after my mom tried to kill me isn't culture. <laughs> That's abuse. And they will say that, but we will say, well, no, you can't say that as my child. That that's, that's abuse because now you're fighting against my culture as a black person. I need to, um, wait, let me just mention something else before I move on to the next thing. Uh, when it comes to the parent and child relationship, um, what you have to understand, we, we cause each other pain as parents and children. Come here though. I'm just going to, and you're so nice and slim, so you'll oh, be perfect. You. <laughs> this is the parent and child relationship. So, you know, mom's saying, clean your room, do this, do that. And you're saying, but mom, everything you're telling me, I don't want to be doing, I don't want to come in at six o'clock in the evening. It's still light outside. I want to go to that party on Saturday. Mom, stop shouting at me. Mom, stop hitting me for that. You didn't need to. <laughs> I'm hurting you. I'm not I'm hurting yeah, you, but you can it. feel it, right? Yeah. yeah. Now imagine mom says, okay then, you don't need to come in at six anymore, but I still need you to tidy your room and I still need you to stop hanging out with that boy that I don't like who's got the nose piercing. Mm -hmm. Now, what's the problem here? Can somebody tell me what the problem is? Because mom stopped. She said you can stay out a bit later. So what's the problem? That's the problem. Thank you. <laughs> so she stopped one thing. And the parent thinks, well, you know, aren't I an amazing parent? Because I've said she can stay out till later, but you still can't see the boy. And that's what it feels like for us, especially in terms of discrimination. When people say, oh, but we have a diversity and inclusion statement at our workplace. Everybody's welcome. And then you go in there and you're not made to feel welcome because you're Asian or you're black or you're, you're, you're Chinese. So that means I've got a diversity and inclusion statement but it means nothing if when you come in, I'm still looking at you and judging you because you're Asian or because you're white or because you're gay or because you're lesbian. If these are the things that you're carrying as young people, let's flip the coin. What are your parents carrying on a daily basis? <laughs> Name some things what you think your parents are carrying on a daily basis. Well, what the what? Like, what? Mom's trying to sell a property at the minute, and she's not going through. Trying to sell property? 
Mom's a single mom. Single, single mom? mom. Single, single mom. mom. Immigrant trying to raise kids. Slow down, slow down. <laughs> single mom, immigrant <laughs> property trying to raise yeah. kids. Sometimes I'm always worried about where like, the food comes from. Where's food coming from? Family back home. Family? Oh my yeah. God. Yeah. My own relationship with their parents yeah. as well. Culture, <laughs> dear God. Yes. <laughs> Worry about us. Yes. <laughs> Worry about yeah, definitely. Now, remember what I said before about the backpack with the bricks? Mm. Imagine your parent. Kind of more of it, though. In some ways. In some ways, yeah, because they're carrying their own. Yeah. And then they're carrying yours as well because unfortunately being a parent is not a switch that you can say well you know just for today for a couple of hours or you know for the next week you know i've got a newborn can you change yourself can you feed yourself because i just need to <laughs> switch off from being a parent for a minute or you come and say well you know um, my student finance needs filling in mom and you're just like actually i'm just taking a break now so i'll fill that in after when the deadline is gone <laughs> you know <laughs> so there is no parent switch that you can just flip and go so imagine that backpack, and your parents are carrying it, but they're also carrying your bricks as well, which is why some parents, when we go to them and say, you know, oh, my, my, my boyfriend or my best friend or my tutor at college or my boss at work, and we just, oh, it's not that we don't want to, but we, what you're doing is you're putting another brick in there. And it's just that time, that it's, it's not right. Can I ask you to come again? Oh, yes. Oh. <laughs> now, as black people, we carry a lot. She's going to put you in a suitcase. No, 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 definitely not. We carry a lot as black people, but imagine this, no color, because mental health doesn't care what color you are. It doesn't care what size you are or sexuality you are. If it's coming for you, it's coming for you. So just imagine this is what a parent carries. Now, this I normally use because I do cultural awareness training. So I normally use these as part of the training because people ask me to come and talk about the black community and black culture. This in the suitcase is what I say to people. When you next see a black person, ask them, what are you carrying? Based on what is in this suitcase, the next black person you see, not this group, I mean, this is what I do for my training. What are you carrying? Because we're seen as angry in the black community and aggressive and violent. Facey, more so than, you know, a white person is, uh, and oh, they're just passionate. A black person is, oh, every, call the police, taser him, calm her down. So think of this as your parents. This is what your parents, not the black community, what I normally use this for. Hold your arms out like this. Come a bit closer, though. Oh, wow. <laughs> Bias. Yeah, hand them to me, please. Harassment. Do you know how many times people get stopped? Sometimes I drive my daughter's car. She has a 2019 BMW. Oh, I think it's stolen, don't they? Because I'm black, I can't possibly afford a 2019 BMW. Community. Yeah, as long as you stay within the triangle in the black community, the family, church, and the community, you're good. Try and get out of that triangle. Family. Always sticking their nose into your business. Stigmatism. Can you explain what that word means? Stigmatism. Do you know what it means to be stigmatized? It's almost like... My head's just gone blank. Stigmatism. It sort of puts like a stigma against Yeah. Like so, yeah. No, yeah, it's almost like if you're, if you're overweight like me, then you must be because you eat a lot. Yeah. You're just greedy. Yeah. Or, you know, if you're too thin, then you must be anorexic and you must be starving yourself. You must be throwing up. Oh. Um, you know, if you dress in boys' clothes, then you must be gay. You know, oh, just well, stigma. You know people that ask you, are you gay? Yeah, just <laughs> stigma. Stigmatization. Physical abuse. Physical abuse is very commonplace in the black community. Physical sexual abuse is very commonplace in the black community. And you can't come in, say you are all adult social workers, you can't come in and tell me that it's wrong to beat my child. If my daughter does something, it's, not, it's fine for me to take this, use the wire from here to beat my child. Now you can't come in and tell me that's abuse because I will tell you that's culture. Right? And my Bible tells me to spare not the rod and spoil the child. Bullying. We get bullied at work. If I 
do something at work or my colleague does something and I pull her up and she's white, she weaponizes her tears, she goes and cries to the boss. The boss calls me in and says, I'm not a team player. She, she's bullying me, but because she's white, I'm the one getting into trouble. Parentification, who knows what, who thinks they know what that means, parentification. It's a very common thing in the black community. It's where black parents, my ex-husband tried to do this to me. When my daughter was born and she was three weeks old, he wanted me to send her home to Nigeria, because he's Nigerian. And they will send the child home till, till they're about 12, 11, bring the child back. And in the time that the child is away, they're pushing out babies. They bring the child back and that child now becomes the parent. So they have to do the school runs. If there's a baby, they have to change, feed the baby, wake up in the middle of the night. They have to take the kids to, to, to after school clubs. They become the parent. And you can't come in a social worker and say, that's wrong, because I'll tell you, no, that's, that's, that's my culture. So it's parentification. Even at 12 years old, a child becomes the parent. Stereotyping. Sexual abuse, as I said, these types of abuse are very common in the black community. And, many other and many other communities as well. Thank you. Expertification. Who knows what expertification? Well, who knows what I mean by expertification? So I'm here, a Beyonce song comes on, and you say to me, Oh my god, what's the next line on that song? You must know it. How am I getting, what, because I'm black? I must know the Beyonce song. Oh, you go, oh my God, can you just twerk for me? Also, oh, because I'm black, you assume that I can twerk. That's expertification. It's a thing. Are you okay? Yeah, I'm good. <laughs> Underrepresentation, spiritual abuse. Religion is very big for us in the black community. And we use that to keep people down. So we will say the Bible tells us that uh, mental health is demonic possession. It's not mental health. You're possessed by several demons. Um, so, you know, don't, don't go and see a therapist. Just go to the, the, the pastor who will bring the praying oil um, and, you know, pray the demons out of you. Thank you. Can I have another volunteer? Because <laughs> we're not going to see go you in a minute. There. Go on, Alan. Uh, yeah? Health inequalities. We all know about that, the rate that black women die in childbirth because of health inequalities. Prejudice, we all know what that means. Hair discrimination, who's heard of the Crown Act? It's a new law been launched in America to stop discrimination of black women based on their natural hair in the workplace where a black woman has been literally fired from work. Oh, I think I've seen Yeah, that. for wearing her natural hair. Even some kids have been sent home from school, black mm -hmm. kids, because they went to school with their big afro, their hair out, and they were sent home from school. So now in certain states in America, they've made it law that you cannot discriminate against the person because of their hair. And they're now bringing that here into this country to make it law as well. That's just one of the things that we deal with. Stop and search, stop oh. and search. We've seen it so many times in videos now where four boys will be walking, three are white, one is black, police car will pull up, and they will stop the black child. And the three white boys will be going, but you're not searching us. Yeah. We're with him. Yeah. yeah, but they only search the black child. And that can happen several times a day. <laughs> stop and search. Discrimination. Social inequality. So we get dumped in the poorest areas of, of Sheffield in terms of housing, and we don't have access to good health care. Mental health issues. Racial inequalities, inequality full stop, religion, oh my God. colorism. Now, who understands what I mean by colorism? Because did you know that in certain um, communities, especially in the black community and the Asian community, the darker you are, the more you're, you're, you're seen as nothing. Mm. That's why skin bleaching is now a billion pound industry because it's been drained into people's head that white is better or lighter is better. So to, to be dark, I know parents who have two kids, one is light, one is dark, and they hate the darker child and worship the lighter child. And can you imagine the impact of that child seeing mommy always hugging and kissing and cuddling my sister or my brother, but she won't me simply because my skin is, is dark. 
White spaces. Who knows what I mean by white spaces? You walk into a room as a black person and you're the only black person there. Or you're the only Asian person there. Or you're the only um, Chinese person there. And they say, oh, but it's a diversity, te a diversity and inclusion meeting. My school was like that. Yeah. Especially all white people. And then there was like two black people. Yeah. yeah. But they will claim that they're diverse and inclusive. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? What school is this? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Wow. That's it. Yeah. Racial profiling. Who knows what that means? That's fine. That's fine. Leave them. Too Honestly, much, leave them. That's too fine. Much baggage. Yeah, that's yes. Fine. That's, that's the point. point of this. Racial <laughs> profiling. Who knows what that means? <laughs> exactly, literally, a black man will be walking through a neighborhood and police will come and say, right, there was a burglary 20 minutes ago and you fit the description. What's the description? You're black. That's racial profiling. Because he's wearing a hoodie, you assume that he was the burglar. All he's doing is walking through the neighborhood. Media portrayal. We all know how black people are portrayed in the media. I've seen things where when Prince Philip died, that's such a prime example. When Prince Philip died and then the rapper DMX died, they put a picture of DMX and a picture of Prince Philip on the front page of the newspaper, and it was like, loving Prince dies age 98, and then rapper troubled died age. Why did you have to use the word troubled? Didn't they do the same with George Floyd or something? Yeah. I don't know what they wrote, but they did write quite exactly. Exactly. This is how media portrays us. Cultural abuse. You have to marry this person. You have to stay a virgin till you're 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 married in some uh, cultures. And oh, yeah. the, the the abuse of it, as I said, some of it is physical, sexual, and you cannot complain against it. You cannot fight against it. It could mean literally your life. White privilege. Who knows what I mean by that? Oh, no. <laughs> okay, so you all know. <laughs> Police brutality. We just need to mention George and move on. Skin color. As I mentioned before, it's a thing in the black community. We are judged based on our skin. I've gotten on a bus, and this is before I had a car, and I've seen white women do this with their handbags. I'm like, lady, I just want to sit down. I don't know you. I'm not going to... Take your back, I just want to sit down. But because of my skin color and the way the media portrays us as black people, you think I'm going to rob you? Why? Classism. Who knows what we mean by classism? Like the class system? Yeah. Social class. Social class. If you're white and rich and you've got money, you're, you're, you're okay. You know, you've got better access to health care and, and, and housing, or if you know the right people. Now imagine this is what your parents, not even half of what your parents are carrying on a daily basis in that backpack that I keep talking about, on their backs with brick. Now you add all of this to the bricks, to the backpack. Oh my God. This is now, if job. I was to say to you, right, hold that for the next couple of hours. Yeah, no, it's not. <laughs> your arms would start hurting and you would say to me, can I please put them down? Oh, Justin. And I would say, yeah, put them down. <laughs> I would bank it down and sit down. I would say, no. Why would I tell her she can't put these down? No. Very good. This is experiencing what your parents are experiencing, but this is also, this is what you carry. Imagine you having to carry that literally carry that around with you because this is what I'm going through as a young person, as a young girl, as a young woman. This is what I'm carrying. And then you say to me, do you know what, Ursula, this is really heavy. Do you mind if I put it down? Do you know what I'm going to say to you? No. Because your parents don't get to put it down. They don't get to put these down. When I leave my house in the morning, I have to think to myself, okay, what do I need to do to get through the day today? to make sure I don't get shot, I don't get tasered, I don't get stopped? What do I have to drum into my kids if the police stop you? What do you do? How do you comply? How do you, how do you? And this is what a DIRA as an organization does. 
These are the things that we have to be talking about and dealing with because these are the things that affect people's mental health on a daily basis. And the only difference is we don't get to put it down when it's heavy, which is why sometimes people hit the ground, end up in the psychiatric wards, end up in the prisons, because it's too heavy, it's too much. I'm gonna finish now by giving you, because you know that I'm the CEO, this year will be the first year that I'll be applying for funding, because I've been running a diary for eight years, um, almost voluntarily, so this year will be the first year that I'll be applying for funding. and. I'll mostly get 45, 40,000 paying for the year for the work I do as CEO. And some people look at that and think, oh my God, I wanna earn 45,000 a year. I, I wanna be able to drive a nice car and, 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 and live in that big house because that's what CEOs do. But what if I said to you as the CEO, all of this is what I'm carrying. I have my own organization. It's very successful as an organization. We get funding bids when there are funding bids. When there's not, we generate our own money because we're a CIC. People look at me and think, oh my God, Esla, you're so successful. You live in a nice house and you drive a nice car and you're the CEO of your organization. And how did you get here? I didn't wake up being CEO. I was your age at one time. I'm 48 now, but I was your age at one time and all the things I had to go through. I was born in this country. I went to Jamaica when I was two. I was sent there when I was two. And that was where, let me just say trigger warning, trigger warning, trigger warning. That was where my abuse began. Remember I said to you, abuse is very commonplace in the black community. Rape and sexual abuse, physical abuse is very commonplace in the black community. That's where my abuse began at the age of two. That was when I first started getting raped and sexually abused to the age of 16. I was brought back to England, two years old, I'm two years old. I was brought back to England when I was seven by my mother and I thought, okay, <laughs> everything's gonna be fine now because she's taken me away from my abusers who were my sister's grandparents who were um, physically beating me and her grandfather would rape and sexually abuse me. And it turns out that my mother till this day is a religious nut. She went to church seven days a week, a Pentecostal church. And she would actively schedule the men from the church to come in the house and rape me. She kept dates, times, and days of who was coming to rape me under the guise of they're raping the demons out of me because I was considered a very bad child. I started cutting when I was seven because of the abuse that was happening at home. I saw my first psychiatrist when I was seven years old. And so they would try and rape the demons. They would come with the praying oil and rape and abuse me. In between the rape and the sexual abuse, there was the physical beatings from my mother. I have an unusually high pain threshold simply because I have so used to having my bones broken as a child. My mother would beat me until either a bone broke or she saw blood. So I spent a lot of my childhood in and out of hospital with broken bones, sexually transmitted diseases. She would beat me with the telephone wire, but what my mother would do is strip the black bit, the plastic off so that the metal underneath and beat me with that to rip into my skin. That was from the age of two to 16. In between the beatings, I was put into care for over two and a half years. This was all in London. I was put into care under the care of Lambeth Council. I don't know, you all know about the Rotherham sexual abuse scandal no. that broke. Um, one of the other biggest, well, it is the biggest scandal to date, mm -hmm. is the uh, Shirley Oaks abuse scandal. It broke in London about four years ago, and it is the biggest sexual abuse scandal in the history of this country. Is she lying about the people? Hmm? Is she lying about something? Who, my mother? No, the, I've never heard of a scandal. Before. Yeah, Rotherham, very, very big story. But the one that happened in London, the Shirley Oaks abuse scandal, that was because Shirley Oaks was a, a group of care homes under the care of Lambeth Council in London. They were opened in the 30s and closed in the 80s and the care homes were actually a paedophile ring that would rotate the children based on preference. So if you were a man and you liked boys under three, you went to this home. If you were a man you liked teenage girls, you went to that home. So in between the beatings and the rapings at home, I was put into care where I was raped and beaten in the care home because I didn't know at the time that the care home was run by a paedophile ring. It was four years ago when a black man who was also in the care home 
went public with the story. It broke. For three years, Lambeth Council denied it, said it didn't happen, there was no abuse. And then Theresa May, when she was still in power, went into the House of Commons one day and said, look, to Lambeth Council, this did happen. You know it happened. Own it. The next morning, they released a very public statement on national television, all in the newspapers. Yes, it did happen. We did know they were drugging and raping the children, and we did cover it up, and we're very sorry. And they put together the biggest compensation package in the history of this country, 100 million pounds to compensate survivors of the Shirley Oak, what is now known as the Shirley Oaks abuse scandal. That was my childhood from two to 16. I got married when I was 25 to a Nigerian, I'm Jamaican, a Nigerian who beat me for two, six years through two pregnancies. I remember he would beat the crap out of me even when my belly was absolutely massive. When I decided to leave him, um, I was, oh, I think my kids were four and six when I decided to leave my ex-husband. And in the kitchen one day, I said to him, I, I, I can't do this anymore. I've had enough. I thought he punched me. Remember, I have a very high pain threshold, so I thought it was somebody just tapped me on my side. I looked down and there was a knife sticking out of my side. His words were, I will kill you before I see you leave me. If my neighbor hadn't heard me screaming, you would never have met me because I'd be buried in a cemetery in London somewhere. That was how we ended up moving here to Sheffield 15 years ago. We were moved here by police and social services because they said he's not going to stop trying. He's going to kill you. We moved here, we lived the first seven months in a refuge. Two weeks after we moved here, I woke up in the middle of the night. My daughter was wheezing, she's an asthmatic. My youngest daughter took her to the doctors in the morning while I was talking to the receptionist and saying, there's something wrong with my child. I had her in my arms and my five-year-old by my side and I just felt her body go. And I turned her face over and her mouth was blue. She stopped breathing right there in the doctor's surgery. Now bearing in mind, you're looking at a woman with severe mental health issues. I've been diagnosed with borderline personality disorder, PTSD, a whole range of mental health issues based on my childhood and abuse. To, for you to move something from, you move this, I put this pen here and you move it here. That for me is, I need the pen to be here because I, I struggle with change. So can you imagine moving to a different city, no friends, no family, no home, no job, no car, I lost, everything and I'm living in a strange refuge with women I don't know. Wake up in the morning, my daughter's not well, take her to the hospital. I remember the doctor saying to me when we, we got to the hospital, Miss Myrie, sit down. And you know when they say sit down, uh -oh. it's not gonna be good. And he said, Miss Myrie, your daughter has pneumonia. And the medication we're giving her for the pneumonia isn't working because of her underlying issue, which is the asthma. So he said, what's happened is all the fluid that was on her chest from the cold has gone into her lungs, her lungs have collapsed. That's putting pressure on the heart. So the heart is failing, the kidney is failing, the liver is failing. If you have any friends or family, tell them to come. Your daughter will be dead within the next 24 hours. This was two weeks after moving here in a refuge. I had nothing but the clothes and we stood in, a couple of suitcases. All I had left as far as I was concerned to lose was my children. And now you're telling me one of them is dying call friends and family. The same friends and family that if they knew where I was would tell my ex-husband so he could come and finish the job. So I'm thinking, I can't call anybody. And I don't know anybody here. So I just remember saying to the doctor, when it's time, please remove all the tubes because when I went to see her, you couldn't even see her little body. She had that many tubes in her. She was on life support. The machine was breathing for her. And I said to him, just remove all the tubes, put her in my arms and let her die in my arms with her sister beside her. I don't want her to die with all those tubes in her. We stayed in that hospital, I think, for about two or three months. I'm sure if you look at my daughter's records now, they will still tell you they don't know how. <laughs> how she got better. But she did, because I'm sure the word miracle is written on her chart somewhere. She got better. Seven months later, we moved into the house we're in now. They had to put us in a house in a cul-de-sac with a sitting room at the front of the house. They had to put alarms. Till this day, I still have alarms on all my windows all my doors in the house because my ex-husband's still trying to find me and kill me. So we have a house that's front facing. So every car, every person that comes into my cul-de-sac, I can see them coming in. And the day we moved into the house, we had a cooker, a washing machine and a bed. No flooring, 
no carpets, no curtains, nothing. That night, my daughter woke up in the middle of the night. <gasps> Seven months the day we moved into our new house with nothing. I recognized the signs from seven months earlier, took her to the hospital. Miss Myrie, sit down. Oh, oh, her lungs have collapsed, the liver's failing, the heart is failing, nothing's working, um, 24 hours to live, call friends and family, she's not gonna make it through the night. Seven months to the day, the day we move into our new house. And that was the, the day I remember thinking, do you know what, God, I, I can't, I, I, I don't have anything left. I'm tired, I'm tired. I've been through rape and abuse and alcoholism and, and sexual violence and domestic violence and physical violence and pain and trauma and a narcissistic mother who would pimp me out to the men in the church. I've got nothing left. I remember thinking, just take me for God's sake. Just, I can't, I'm tired. Do you remember what I said about what we're carrying? And that was when I wanted to put down the backpack. And I couldn't, because who was going to take it? I had no friends. I had no family. I only had my children. And if I put down the backpack with all their stuff in there, because I've still got a six-year-old, Mummy, why is the doctor saying Tyra's dying? Is Tyra dying, Mummy? And at that minute, I just want to, not now. But I can't put it down. I can't. Who's going to pick it up? Who's going to pick her up? Who's going to hold her sister? That's where I'm coming from. And that doesn't include the breakdowns. I had my first breakdown when my daughter was three months old because when she was born, I was so scared that people were going to hurt her the way I was abused. I wouldn't let the midwives weigh her. Because if they had their back to me and they've got her in the little machine and they're waiting and I hear her crying, I'm thinking they're doing something, they're doing something, they're doing something. So I wouldn't let anybody hold her. So for the first three weeks when she was born, I didn't sleep. And what happened was I was sitting in the rocking chair one day, with my newborn three weeks old, and I was so tired and I'm rocking away and I fell asleep. And guess what happened? The baby dropped. Three weeks old. She fell out of my arms because I fell asleep in the chair. Woke up, took her to the hospital, thank God she was fine. But that was when they gave me an ultimatum. Miss Myrie, while you're not abusing your child, you're still a danger to your child. Because you're, 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 you won't let anybody hold her. And you're not sleeping because you're thinking people are going to hurt her. So you've got two options. Either go into a psychiatric ward for mothers and babies, or we take your three-week-old baby away and put her into care. So that was my first... No, before that, I went into to section because I tried to, to terminate the pregnancy when they told me that they couldn't let me know whether or not I would harm her when she was born. So I remember leaving the doctor's office when I was seven months pregnant. I asked for a termination because I said, I'd rather kill my child in the womb than have her born and I abuse her. And he said, Miss Mary, you're seven months pregnant. <laughs> it's too late. We can't terminate. And I said, yeah, but what if when she's born, I harm her and I break her bones and I break her fingers for not getting her homework right? just like my mother did to me. And he said, we cannot terminate. You're too far gone. And I said, okay, no problem. I walked out of his office, found the first flight of stairs and threw myself head first down the stairs because I thought if you're not gonna terminate her, I'm gonna terminate her. I spent two months in hospital, slept on a spine board. When I came out, they wheeled me across the road to the Maudsley <laughs> Mental Ward in London. That was my first input into the psychiatric wards and I've been sectioned and put on medication and straight jackets and ever since. But I told you that because I need you to see that the road to what you want to be, what you want to become, the, the, the big CEO, the company owner, the astronaut, oh, you might not have to go through what I went through, but believe you me, you will spend your life pulling knives out of your back and your front. Years ago, people, your friends, your family, would stab you in the back. Now people will stab you in the front because they want you to know. I want you to know I did it. So they're not stabbing you in the back and running away anymore. They're stabbing you so you can see it was me. And that's your friend. You tell your friend, I've got this great business idea. Who knows how Facebook got started? Three people started Facebook. 
in a, in a college room. And Mark Zuckerberg stole the idea. What? Well, I thought he was the one that came up with it. No, it was three of them came up with the idea. He went behind his friend's back, stole the idea, and started Facebook. They sued him and got 10 million each. Now, that, they were friends. So don't think, you know, oh, but the, it's important for you to know that I am CEO of my organization. And I now get to talk in, in the House of Parliament and I get to, I'm a, um, a consultant for the CQC and I do a lot of work with Sheffield Health and Social Care and all these big organizations and I get paid a lot of money to do all these talks, serious amount of money, just two and a half hours, I will charge 550 pounds just to talk for two and a half hours. The other day I had somebody asked me to speak for five minutes and they paid me 50 pound. And people look at that and think, I, I, I want that. God, talking for 10 minutes and I get paid 50 pounds, I'll talk for an hour. Because they think, oh my God, you made it. You... But do you see what I had to go through? And do you believe me when I'm still carrying all this? Don't get it twisted. When I became CEO, all this didn't melt away. All this didn't disappear. I still carry it, I just carry it well. Because we're all so good at wearing masks. Mm -hmm. We're all so good at smiling and pretending that everything is, it's fine, and this is why I say to people, stop using those two words, safe space, safe space. Oh, come to, what's the name of this place? Um, Element, because Element is a safe space. Come to Sheffield City Council Town Hall, it's, come to my house. Your house is not a safe space. Element is not a safe space because Element is brick. Your house is made of brick and wood, so your house is not my safe space. This building is not my safe space. You are the safe space. You, and you, if you say to me, come to my house, you are my safe space. Because if I come to your house and you open the door and you're like, what do you want? I don't feel welcome. Or if you open the door and you're stood there like, I'm not welcome. If I come here and Tashinga and I'm trying to talk to her, she's, got, she's invited me here to speak. But I'm talking to her, she's like, yeah. You're no longer my safe space. So it's not the building that's the safe space. It is you, your tone, your body language, your look. You're your mother's safe space. You're your father's safe space. You're your brothers, your sisters, your husband, your wives, your partners, safe space. If your boyfriend comes home and says, babe, I've had a hard day at college or uni or work, and you're like, Tss. <laughs> okay, so I won't bother. <laughs> Suddenly, you're no longer his safe space. If your mum says, you know what? Oh, I'm really struggling to pay this bill and I don't know what. Oh, for God's sake, mum. You're no longer your mother's safe space. So stop telling people come to, this is a safe, you need to become somebody's safe space. I hope you've enjoyed my presentation. Have you got any questions? This is why I told you to put me second so that it's not. Have you got any questions? And bearing in mind, there is no question you can ask me that's too personal, too deep, too racist, anything you want to ask me, absolutely anything. You mentioned that um, you could, like you still carry all that weight, but you carry it better. What did you mean by that? Did you, is that to mean that you found a effective coping mechanism? Or? Definitely, because you, you can't put it down. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? You can't put depression down. It's not something you can take off like a handbag and say, well, I'm leaving it at home today. You just can't. <laughs> You've got to carry it. Do you know what I mean? Your, your partner says something to you and it hurts you. You can't put that down. Every day, discrimination, race, bias, all these things I have to carry. So I've learned how to cope. Borderline personality disorder, which is what I was diagnosed with, is basically what happens when you're, you're abused in childhood. It's caused as a result of childhood trauma. So with borderline personality disorder, I don't see gray areas. I'm not capable of seeing gray areas. Something is either black or white. I don't have a filter. So I'm what my psychiatrist calls a social chameleon. So I will go into situations, every situation I'm in, and I mimic behavior because I don't understand social cues. Somebody who's a size 42 will come, you know, it's a, an event and we're all dressed up nicely and we're all standing in a group and they'll be like, oh, I just bought this new dress today and the dress is screaming. I'm, I'm, I can't breathe. 
Yeah. And they're like, oh, do I look <laughs> nice in this? And I will be the person to say, no, you don't. Because you're clear, you know, the dress doesn't fit you, love. <laughs> and everybody will be like, I don't like what? That. She <laughs> asks the question, what? I don't understand. Oh my God. So I don't understand social cues because what would be the socially acceptable thing to say? Yes. Oh, nice. Nice. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I don't understand things like that. So I will be the one to say, no, um, it doesn't fit you. Go and change. <laughs> now, I, if my kids are around, I'm getting this under the table. <laughs> you know, if somebody asks a question, I'm getting kicked under the table, which means mummy, think before you open your mouth, right? <laughs> What's the socially acceptable thing to say? And if my kids aren't around, my brain is going a million hours a minute because I've got to keep up with, what did you just ask me? What is the, I know what I wanna say, but is that the right answer? That's why I don't socialize. I don't go out, I don't go pubs, clubs, coffee with the girls, all that kind of crap because it's exhausting for me to watch the room and watch body language. What is humor. I don't understand humor. So when people, when somebody says something and I laugh and everybody else is thinking, but she just said her mother died. And I'm like, is that wrong? Oh, I don't understand those things. So I have to watch the room. If everybody else is laughing, I laugh. <laughs> if everybody else isn't laughing, I don't laugh. But can you imagine how yeah. <sighs> exhausting that is being a social chameleon. That's what borderline personality disorder is. And I have to wear that mask because there's a saying this woman, disabled woman said, she said, I'm not disabled when I'm at home because she's in a wheelchair, she's disabled. So when she's at home, the kitchen sink is at this height. Um, you know, she's got a lift in her house. She said, it's when I'm outside that I come, become disabled because society set up for able-bodied people. So I don't have mental health issues at home. I'm not black at home. I'm not a black woman. I'm not a black CEO. I'm just mummy. I'm just Ursula. It's when I step outside my door that I'm suddenly BME. I'm a minority. I'm black. I'm a threat because of my skin color. And these are things that I as a CEO have to deal with on a daily basis. These are the things that make me the CEO that I am, and these are the things that you will have to deal with and live with and go through, because I know all of you in this room, there's not one person in this room who isn't going through something right now, who isn't dealing with something, whether you can't sleep properly or you can't eat properly, or that boy is not returning your texts, or he, he's, um, what's it, ghosting you, you know what that means, um, you know, you're all going through something right now. Maybe you want to come out and you can't because you won't be accepted. Maybe you want to tell your parents, I don't want to be a Muslim anymore. I don't want to wear that um, hijab anymore. I just want to fit in with society because you know I'm getting blamed for every bomb that goes off and I'm seen as, as, a, as, a, as a terrorist. We're all going through something. But can anybody here tell? When I walked in here, would you, and I said to you, okay, um, this is me, this is Ursula. Would you have known all the things that I've been through? Because I don't look like what I've been through. None of us do. We, you know, you meet people, are you all right? Before you even say, well, yes or no. Okay, that's good. And you're thinking, but I didn't even ask. I didn't ask you a question because we're just living in that society where everybody is now professional liars. It's so true. Because everybody is fine. You get on the Zoom, how are you fine? You're all right, love. Yeah, fine. I'm the only person in the Zoom. If I've had a bad day, you're going to hear about it <laughs> because I don't have a filter, you know. And people love me. They're like, oh, thank God. You're so refreshing because everybody's fine. I'll be like, actually, no. That man this morning, he got on my last nerve. And I, because I'm not capable of, that's why when I do things, I have to put a filter in place. Before I leave my house, I have to put a filter in place because I don't always have my kids to be doing this. So I have to put in my own filter to just get me through the day so I'm not offending people or upsetting people. Aroni, who did your the talk with the beads, that's my eldest daughter. Yeah. 
Yeah, That's my eldest, and I've got a younger daughter. Now she's been through the breakdowns. She's watched mommy be sectioned. She's been taken into, into care by social services. She's watched mommy on and off medication. She's seen mommy come upstairs and mommy was fine one minute and suddenly mommy's got a bandage on because I've been in the bathroom self-harming and what's that mommy? Oh, I just felt, but I didn't see you for mommy. Mm -hmm, but I did. But if you didn't know that she'd been raised by a mother like me, what did you think when you saw her presentation? What did you think of her? Very kind. Young, successful, she must have had an amazing childhood. No, nope. raised by a mother with serious mental health issues, consistently sectioned, having to go to school, deal with mommy's issues, deal with her sister being in and out of hospital for the first six years, constantly told she's dying. That was what the, the girl who stood in front of you has dealt with. But we're all so good at the presentation on the outside. But underneath, but it just goes to show because people say to me, what's your relationship like with your children? I broke the cycle. I've never put my hand on my children. I've never beat them the way I was beaten. I've never called them stupid like my mother used to tell me, you're ugly, you're too black, you're too stupid, you're too useless, you're too pathetic. Every day my mother would tell me that I've never told my children that. I have a very warm, affectionate, even though they say that I'm too affectionate, my kids, because I'm always hugging them, <laughs> oh. always kissing them. Just two years ago, my youngest, he was 20, came and sat on my lap one day, randomly, I'm watching TV, minding my business, came and sat on my lap and said, you know, mom, I had the best childhood ever. And I was like, so where was I when you were having this childhood? <laughs> because that's not what I remember. I remember the breakdowns and the sectionings and, you know, you lot crying and been taken into care. Where was I when you were having this childhood? They said, yeah, but mommy, you were every single sports day, never missed one. You were at every school play. You were at every parents' evening. You never allowed us to have a sleepover until we were 15. You never allowed us to wear makeup until we were 16. Every day for an hour, up until I think my children were 14 or 15, we would have what's known as family time. And family times means I switch off my phone, unplug the landline, and for one hour, my children have my undivided attention. I know every word in SpongeBob. <laughs> every, I swear to God, every word in SpongeBob. Zoe, Zoe, what is it? Zoe and Bob, Zoe and somebody. Um, all these Disney Channel things. I know every sentence in those things because whatever you want to do with mommy for that hour, you have my undivided, I'm not on Facebook, I'm not on my phone. One hour. That's what made my children say we've had the best child because while my mental health was in the toilet and I was constantly being sectioned and I was constantly, this, I was a very present parent, very loving, very affectionate, very physical parent. And I am, I just want to read something and then I'll finish. This is what one of our service users who's 22 wrote last year about Adira. Adira has truly helped save me and offered me more support in the last two years than any service or institution has my own whole life. Last summer 2019, I went through a very dark, stressful, mentally and emotionally exhausting few months where I was homeless and going through family problems whilst having to handle my mother's debts and sorting out my EU settled status. Adira supported me through all of it by coming to the meetings, offering counsel, giving me a safe place to breathe. As a young black person, I have never felt safer and understood and more protected than I did in the hands of Adira. And if it wasn't for Mama Ursula and her organization, my mental health would have collapsed and I would have ended up in sectioned. I wouldn't have come out of the situation and I wouldn't have been able to make it to university. This has literally saved my life and given me a chance to work through my pain and mental health to become happier, better, and see a future for myself. I've been inspired by the work of Mama Ursula and Adira and has given me hope and a vision for my future. And I'm truly grateful for them. I believe this service needs to be offered as a first point of contact, especially to the black community and the young black youths who don't feel like they are understood and have anyone to talk to or offer them advice and help. 
This organization would truly have a massive impact on the lives of so many people if only they had the more funding and support to back up all their good work. They could be saving more lives. And that was a young girl, age 22, who wrote that. And I have hundreds of these feedback as the CEO of Adira. That is who I am. Thank you for your time. <laughs> Thank you so, 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 so You're much for, for sharing that bad. one. Wow, goddamn. I feel inspired. <laughs> I don't know if you guys feel inspired. I feel very, I don't know. How does everyone feel? How do you feel after that? Traumatized. <laughs> <laughs> Can't imagine how How do you feel? Um, a little emotionally intense. I'm not going to lie, but uh, yeah, I, I, feel, I feel inspired. Yeah. How do you I feel? I literally stop myself from crying. Mm. How do you feel? Oh, How do you feel? I feel like a lot of people in this world. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Definitely. How do you feel? I feel shocked. Like, that was a lot. Mm. Um, like, you know when you think, oh, maybe I've been through a rough spot. Yeah. Then you've been through all that, and I'm like, wow. But I'm almost 20 odd years older than you. Yeah, so, true. you know. You've still got time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How do you feel? How do you feel? Um, emotionally, I'm good. Well. <laughs> <laughs> do you know what? It's one of the things that you have to like. You just have to sit that back and process yeah. everything. Mm -hmm. But I feel like a positive we need to take out is that even though we all go through a lot and you can go through so so many intense situations like that, you can still come out the other yes. side and inspire other people. And use it as like a story of survival and just be able to impact so many young people and just make sure that people hear this message, know that they're not alone in what they're going through and just make the world a better place. Like it's amazing. We thank you so much for being here and sharing like your time and your wisdom as well. Like even then I was thinking, wow. <laughs> the whole time I was thinking, bro, bro, I was like, it was like a movie. This is not real, it can't be, but it is. It really, really is. And I hope that you guys can be empowered by that and just think, do you know what? Like, if Mama Ursa can do it, then we definitely can. Yes. That's the main yeah. thing about this. I want to come out and feel more empowered to go out and not let anything hold us back. Not that stereotype that people are saying, oh, no, you can't do that because you're too young. You don't look a certain way. You're not smart enough. You're not that. No. Nothing can hold us back. We are who we say we are. It's down to us to decide what we want to be when we're older, what we want to do with our lives, how we want other people to see us. Not what this person says about me, not what my parents have put onto me and all that kind of stuff. Because at the end of the day, we are our own people and we are strong, young, beautiful, gorgeous females. And we can do anything that we put our mind to it. And whilst we're talking about sort of stereotypes and careers and all that kind of stuff, my lovely, 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 gorgeous friend Renoi here has got like a very inspirational story just to sort of show that just because you don't fit in the status quo that tells you that you're destined to go, your parents are astronauts, so you're going to inherit this amazing life. So you can become a pilot who would do all that kind of stuff, but your mom was just a cleaner, so you can't do anything. You're probably going to end up, I don't know, maybe you can be a dog walker, but that's about it. But no, that's not how it works because we're now the new generation. And we're not all about just inheriting stuff because we're going to write our own legacy. We're going to create our own narrative. And we're the main characters in our stories. Read it if you want, but you're not an editor. You're not even a publisher because that's my book, that's my story, that's what I'm writing. And it's something that we're continuously going to be writing. And guess what, if we don't want the story anymore, it's okay, we can change it now. We have the power to adapt and become who we want to be, grow into these beautiful swans, create our own empires, and nobody can tell you different. Does that make sense to everyone? Amazing. So, Reno, over to you, my darling. Well, I feel like I'm not ready. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like it's not a bit overwhelmed. <laughs> <laughs> Much to follow. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody says that when they've got to speak after me. Mm -hmm. You're always like, nah. Yeah, everybody's got what I'm supposed to say now. Okay, so um, my story is more just like about what I'm doing now and how I got to this stage that I'm at now. And I hope it like inspires you guys, but I'm not sure. 
what sort of careers you'll want to go into. I heard like a few bits and bobs, but I'm not sure. But anyway, so I'll start like right from the beginning. So I grew up in Cyprus. I didn't really grow up here. I don't know why I grew up in Cyprus. Everyone asks me and I, I don't really know why. <laughs> but um, yeah, I grew up there. Nice place to grow up. It was just like, yeah, every, everything was good. Like the childhood, everything like that. And then my parents split and it was like, what's happening now? A bit confusing. We didn't know where we were going to move to. So we left, we went to Spain first and that's where we were like kind of based. But that was, that's a whole story in itself. And then we moved to England. But my mum, I don't know, like, my mum, it was like an arranged marriage between my mum and my dad. So my mum was flown from Pakistan to England to marry my dad. Like, it wasn't like, they, they just hand over, like, responsibilities. That's how marriage works in that sort of culture. So my mum couldn't really speak English properly. Like, her sole purpose was to be a wife. Like, that's how, that's how the culture works mm -hmm. in, back home. But anyway, yeah, so for my mum to be moving from... Spain to England with two kids by herself and she couldn't really speak English and she didn't really have any like she didn't have any family here like because once you get sent from your home country to get married you lose touch with all of your family like you're by yourself in that country so she was all by herself but luckily I forgot to add this sorry before we moved to Cyprus I was actually born in Sheffield so like I was born here and then I moved to Cyprus when I was like two because my sister was born here too and she's only like one and a half years younger than me. But yeah, so we, we were like British citizens basically, so we had a ticket back to the UK. <laughs> so that's why my mum was yeah, like, yeah, yeah anyway. It reminds me, it helped you out. But my mum was like, yeah, okay, we need to like go back to England because you know, like England is actually quite good at like providing you with like support, like all of that sort of stuff. So we moved back here. Um, I lived in Fair Park. She was, I remember like, first moving here, like we just had like one bedroom. We were sharing with my dad's mum's, cause she wasn't living in her place anymore. But it was like one bedroom flat. We all used to sleep there. Same sort of thing, like no carpets, yeah. nothing, like one microwave, nothing. Do you know what I mean? Like there's not a lot, but it was enough for me. I don't know why I'm touching. <laughs> but anyway, so um, that happened and then it was like difficult because like one of my friends would be like, oh yeah, like come come on to your house. I'd be like, oh, my house. <laughs> I don't know where to bring you. Do you know what I mean? And they'd like all go out and like they'd invite me out and stuff and I'd just be like, yeah, can't come, can't come, can't come. But anyway, that happened. And then um, eventually like there's a huge waiting list for like housing when, when you want to be housed, like, but you're on the priority list if you've got children. Mm -hmm. So we got letting them that um, there was a house available. Moved to Fairf Park, but Fairf Park's very, Obviously, like it's a good it's a good area. I feel like you can make whatever area you live in a good area, <laughs> but I don't know how to put it. It's like there's a lot of like the surrounding there can be quite difficult. Like it's really easy to like fall into the things that people around you are doing, and I think that to be honest, I I'm not really. I feel like the councillors, not the councillors, the government is kind of to blame as well because. I feel like the children and the youth there are trapped in a cycle mm. and they don't really see the end to that cycle because mm. your friends, I don't know, started dealing drugs. Like, especially for the boys, like, your friends started dealing drugs. So you're like, okay, like, I might as well do that. It's some quick money. The teaching there is different as well. Like, they won't pay as much attention to the people who are, you know, naughty. But for me as well, I was a very naughty kid. Like, I didn't concentrate. I'd never concentrated, never did any of that stuff. And to them, it's like, oh, forget about that naughty kid because... They don't want to put in time, but they don't realise that you're acting the way you're acting because there's other things that are going on in your life. And I feel like I've spoken to quite a few like children who've had like concentration issues. I've tutored some kids who needed help because like a few autistic autistic children as well, because their parents told me that they were like struggling because the school wasn't supporting them enough. And when I tutored them, they just said they want to learn, but they don't have the support and people don't understand that they come from those sort of backgrounds. I'm going so off topic. But anyway, <laughs> so that happened. And um, so I was in Fair Park, that's where I kind of grew up. And then my dad decided to reappear into my life and was like, oh, um, because he has properties in Cyprus, basically. I'm just gonna tell you my whole life story. I'm not good at this whole talking thing. <laughs> I don't do it regularly, <laughs> as you might be able to tell. So it's just like a it's just like a conversation thing. I'm just gonna keep yeah, on yeah, conversation yeah. level. But anyway, so my dad has like properties and stuff, so my mum was like 
okay, but you've got you've got money, so we need you know the divorce and the way it works like in England is like you're entitled to like half of what mm. the person had. So like my mom's like keyboard warrior in sending all these like <laughs> threats like we need half of your stuff. So because of that, my dad was like, okay, I'll send him to private school. So that's where I went to private school because my mum was like, my mum was always very, very engaged with me as a child. Like she always wanted the best for me, especially because when you go through like an abusive marriage where, and you're all you're alone, your children are the only thing that you've got. And like, my mum always tells me like, I'm a miracle, I'm a miracle, whatever, but not whatever, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> she's always like, tells me that I'm a miracle, but it's like, it actually, like they actually, really really value you and they want the best for you so that's why for me my childhood was, was the best childhood even though whatever happened happened but why i'm saying that is because she fought so hard for primary school it doesn't have to be in your catchment area so because i got back at the end of year six i went to exel junior school which is like the complete if you know where exel is compared to fair park it's like the opposite ends of sheffield but my mum used to check there every day to make sure that i was going to that school so that she could kind of give me like a better opportunity and then after that, the reason she argued with my dad was so that I could go to private school because in, for secondary school, you need to be within the catchment area. And Fair Park, it was only like, I'm not saying Fairvale's a bad school, but like <laughs> Fairvale, <laughs> but like Fairvale, <laughs> no, Fairvale, Fair terrible. Park. It's terrible. Stuff like, that were in my, <laughs> stuff like that were in my catchment area. And my mum was like, I can't send her. I was there for school. only two years and it was shite. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, so anyway, so I went to private school um, still was messing about quite a lot. Couldn't really speak to anyone about any kind of problems because mm -hmm. it's like call child line. I'm like, but I'm not. It's not. It's not like do you? Yeah. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like I don't know. I don't know what to say. Like it's not. They don't really understand it. And also, private school brings a whole other side yeah. of stress because then everyone's going skiing and like. I went on the holidays. My mum still rinsed my dad, but like <laughs> I still went on the holidays and stuff. But. It's just different because the mindset's different. Mm. Like they're they're very very privileged basically, yeah. and it's hard to fit into that. So that was a huge thing. Like even though my mum thought, oh, I'm doing the best thing, like I'm giving her an opportunity. I was being young. It's like, but we've got this to do right, and we've got to fit in with this. And they're going to that party, so I need to look like this. I need to dress like this. I need to have the little brown bag that everyone has. Why do I need that? But everyone had it. It's, there's certain things at that school that you had to have, and if yeah. you didn't have them, then you weren't like a part of the thing. But I couldn't go to my mum because my mum's working hours and hours on minimum wage to provide for this council house that we're living in, Fair Park. So I couldn't go home and be like, mum, I need a little brown bag. Do you know what I mean? Like I couldn't yeah. do it. But anyway, so that was another thing that I, like one of the other struggles that I faced, I'd say, trying to fit into that sort of, that sort of like social circle and because i was still like in that group which made it even harder like i was in that group that was always out like at all the parties but i was like yeah i can't come i can't come so they started being like what's wrong but anyway then sheffield high decided that i was behaving like my behavior wasn't acceptable i was never rude to teachers like i'd never swear or like use bad language it was more i had a problem with concentration so like i'd distract people around me and they would, their results would suffer, but my results wouldn't suffer. So then the teachers started getting really irritated and then my results started suffering. So they gave me an ultimatum. They were like, well, they called my parents in after five years of private school. Mm -hmm. And they were like, we're not letting her sit her GCSEs here. You need to, you need to take her out and she needs to sit her GCSEs somewhere else. And my parents were like, we've paid for five years. <laughs> and that's like 50, 50, 60 K mm -hmm. that it adds up to. And you're telling us that she can't sit her GCSEs. So they were like, okay, We'll make an exception. She can sit her exams, but she needs to be taken out straight after. So I did my exams, got all A's, A's, and then, yeah. wow. and then they asked me back. So they sent a letter. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't make yeah. sense, does it? Yeah. Because that's oh another thing about that. I'm not saying anything bad about Sheffield High because it's a good school, but <laughs> they did this thing where towards like after. So if you pick up a GCSE, you're and you've done two years of it you're gonna to wanna to do the exam. Like, mm -hmm. even if you fail, it's like, oh, done two years of it, I might as well do the exam. But they got to a point where, like, you'd get to a month before the exam, for the GCSE exams, and they'd handpick the people who they think they're gonna fail that GCSE and tell yeah. them, we don't think you should sit yeah. that exam anymore. Yeah. But why would you do that when they've been through education for mm -hmm. two years? Yeah. 
That's why even if you just try. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah at least. But exactly, because at the end of the day, you could get a C. Yeah. But they don't want their scoreboard that's to right. look yeah. bad because yeah. it affects the school's reputation. That's right. So I don't know, but that's their way of doing things. And that, it was so funny to me when they sent me that letter back saying, Hi, I'm like, we'd but love to have you back. <laughs> and I was like, I'm not coming back. <laughs> but anyway, so then I went to Tapton. Um, yeah, <laughs> moving from a girls, all girls school to a state school, even though Tapton was like ranked the next best one after the girls school, because my parents were like, if you want to leave the girls school, you have to go to the next, like, do you know what I mean? The, the next, next best, best school, school. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, we need to keep your locks basically still. So I was like, okay, went to Tapton, too much freedom, because in Sheffield High, you are kind of spoon fed, do yeah. DOV, go on a school trip, do one extracurricular activity, you do one humanity, one language, one, do you know what I mean? Like they mm -hmm. literally make the perfect report for you. But at Tapton, it's like, there you go. You've got three hours free every day. You can do whatever you want with your time, <laughs> manage it. And I was just like, I'm out every day, not coming to lessons, getting on calls in sixth form. Like there was a lot of things that were going wrong at home anyway. Like there was other things that were going on. But my way of dealing with it was like, school was like my free time. Like I'd go to school, and I'll just like relax. Yeah, like it was like my social time, but school isn't social time. Mm. But anyway, and then also like when teachers start, there was one teacher who was really racist, oh. really, really racist. I'm not even gonna mention any names. But anyway, she was really racist and she used to be like, she'd made comments and she had kind of like a reputation at that school. And as soon as I started going to her lessons, she started like picking on me. And it was very, very obvious that she was picking on me. And I don't react well to situations like that. Like I lose concentration straight away. Like I won't engage in the lesson. Mm -hmm. I'll just kind of like, it was it was the wrong way to handle the situation basically. Cause I'll talk about how the right way to handle the situation is after. Cause obviously I fixed it after. But in that moment in time, I was just like, I don't want to do it. Like mm -hmm. I don't want to be sat in this classroom where I'm being targeted. Do you know what I mean? Like being picked on all the time. Cause it just makes you feel like, what's the point in even doing anything? Mm -hmm. So, got kicked out of Tapton um, because I got basically Tapton's the only school in Sheffield that still do um, the AS levels. I don't know if they're still doing it, but they were doing it while I was there. So, if you don't have to get 3Ds, then you get kicked out. But there was no way I was going to get 3Ds. Like, I was used to kind of just floating through GCSEs, <laughs> like, it's all right. And then A levels just hit me like a truck. Mm -hmm. So, I wasn't used to like the independent learning side of things. So yeah, I failed. I got used in all of my subjects. I didn't do anything. The invigilators were looking at me because I'm like, what is she doing? I was just sat there like, I didn't answer any of the questions on the paper because I'm one of them people, like I know my potential and I knew I wasn't going to achieve my potential. So I was like, it's such a stubborn and arrogant mindset. I don't advise it to anyone. But I was like, if I'm not going to get like an A, then I don't want anything. Like I'm not going to do the exam because that's just like, I don't want to do it. That's just how bad my mindset was. That was me at GTSC, but I didn't do my maths. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, it's the wrong, yeah, but it's the wrong mindset because then I realised, like, it's about consistency. Anyway, I'll talk about that in a second. But it's about <laughs> consistency. But anyway, so I got kicked out of that school and I kid you not, they said they would make exceptions normally, but because of my track record and, like, how bad my attendance was and how bad, like, everything else was, like, my, whatever the complaints that I was getting was, they were like, Darby, like, you need to go. And all the teachers were kind of like, one teacher, she used to say in front of me all the time, like, she's going round and round in circles, like, she's not going to get anywhere. Oh, what do you mean I'm not going to get anywhere? Like, you can't speak, no matter how much you feel like that about the student, you can't speak like that in front of the student. Like, you need to be professional, you need to carry yourself in a certain manner. But she didn't. Um, but yes, yeah, so I left that school. I was like... That's when I hit like a reality check because sixth form is actually quite important. College is important. Like whatever education you're in, it's important to take it seriously at the time because you don't realise until after that it's kind of too late. Like no one told me that I can't retake the same A levels. So I thought, oh, I'm getting kicked out of sixth form. That's all right. I'll go and I'll do because I was doing physics, chemistry, and maths A level. So I thought I'll leave and I'll go do it somewhere else. But I left and no other sixth form in Sheffield was like will take you on. They were all like, sorry, your funding, because you get a certain amount of funding from the government, it's been used up. So you can't you can't redo your thing. So I was just like, stressed. And then my parents were like, what the hell did we pay for private school for? Like, what are you doing? But eventually I was gonna go to Hillsborough College, but then King Edwards, I don't know why they were taking on, they were taking on like they had some more spaces, they were taking on more people. So I got in there 
Um, and I still had no idea what I wanted to do. And I feel like it's an important thing to understand that you don't need to know what you want to do right now. And I feel like that's where I'm going to, like, that's what this talk's really about. But I know it took me a long time to get there, but <laughs> you don't really need to know what you want to do because I had no clue what I wanted to do until this one day at King Edward when it was like a women engineering day. And these, I, the only reason I went outside was because there were some Ferraris. <laughs> they brought some like Ferraris into school and they were like, oh yeah, like there's some cars, like everyone's taking pictures in the cars, you got to sit inside and like rev the engine. And I was like, I'm quite a fan girl, like I do like cars. <laughs> so I was like, oh, was like, I'm gonna go have a look. Went downstairs, which is where, where it was, looked at the cars, I was like taking pictures and everything. And then this lady came up to me, she's like, you're right. I was like, yeah, I'm fine. And she was like, really wise looking lady and I was like oh hi and then I just started talking to her and she was telling me about how she did like she was the only woman who did like this computer code thing and it was kind of interesting kind of not interesting like I was just like oh, okay is this how we make money like is this what I need to do but then I just kind of left it and then there was this teacher because she said to the teacher that was there Mr Kavanagh who's the teacher who organized the event for women in engineering she said to him like you need to get her involved with something like she specifically said that girl needs to be like involved in something. But I was just like, yeah, yeah, I've taken my picture, I'm done. Like, I'm going upstairs. But he kept chasing me around the school, like, for like a whole <laughs> month, like two months after that. He was like, Manon, come on, like, when are you going to do something? Like, when are you going to do an experience day or like go and like do a placement? And I was just like, oh, forget placements, get placement. But then I did it and I realized how beneficial it was because I did a placement at Rolls Royce. Um, oh. And that was like, me working in the design section. And people don't realize that Rolls-Royce isn't actually cars, it's jet engines. So I was working in that section. Um, and the first day I hated it, but after that I loved it. And this is the thing, I feel like, for you to actually understand what you want to do, the only thing I can say to you is like experience. Like honestly, go out and do placements in like, you can go anywhere, like just do placements in the most random places and just find out what you actually genuinely really want to do because so many people that I know go on to university and at the end of it, they're like, I don't even like it. Like, I don't even know what to do or like, they don't want to do the job. They don't understand what it actually entails. But if you actually do the placement and you do the experience, you understand what you're passionate about. Because I think so many people are lost, like with, do you guys feel passionate about the things that you want to do? Mm -hmm. That's so good. That was really good. Because no. <laughs> not a lot of people do. Mm -hmm. And when like, that's why I think the education system's a bit old fashioned and I do think that it needs to be changed because what I'm doing now is an apprenticeship. So through that placement that I did, I went on to do another placement because I, I was just like, it was like a light bulb moment for me. Like I was like, this is what I want to do. So um, Rolls Royce is diff like, it's difficult though because there's like 40,000 applicants and 200 people get in. But it was the only thing that I ever thought like, I want it really, really bad and I need to work really, really hard. So I'm just, like took myself away from like everyone. The teachers were like complaining about me again. Like they were like, oh, she's not coming to lessons on time. I was working on my own timetable though. But they were like, she's not coming to lessons on time. She's not gonna do this. She's not gonna do that. She's not gonna be able to achieve her results if she carries on like this. And then next like, I don't know, a few months later I came back and I was like, oh, I just wanted to let the school know that I got a Rolls Royce apprenticeship. Like all over Twitter, can you come do this event? Can you come do this event? Can you talk to this class? That's so good what you did. Oh, Mr. Kavanagh, yeah, putting all the teachers' names on the website, everything like that. But apprenticeships for whatever sort of thing you're going for are really, really useful. And I feel like it's a it's an option that's ignored because there's a stigma attached to it. Mm -hmm. So with apprenticeships, like with the apprenticeship that I'm doing, I get an aerospace engineering degree, which is all paid for by Rolls Royce. I get a job with Rolls Royce, which I'm, so I'm in the business right now for four years. I'll be working alongside engineers that have been in the business for decades. So you're getting first-hand like experience, you're getting all your stuff paid for and you're getting paid to be there. Mm -hmm. So like, mm -hmm. there's, no, there's no negatives of an apprenticeship. So like, for me, I was always like, school, uni, job. But why is it school, uni, job? Because school, uni, job means you get debt, You've not got any, not really got any experience. Like, yeah, you're living like uni life, but I can still, I try. I try to still do that. I go uni in Manchester and I feel like she's my housemate. I'm down there too much. But no, like, honestly, I just think 
that apprenticeships, I always thought, I don't know why, I personally did look down on apprenticeships as well. Like people would tell me like, oh, I'm doing an apprenticeship. I'd be like, oh yeah, okay, cool, whatever. Like, it's not a big thing, but you can do it for, I know someone else who's doing pharmacy apprenticeship. Um, there's a, law. like nuclear one, law ones, business oh, ones, like, there's mm -hmm. so many different apprenticeships. And I feel like this talk has made me realize that that's what I want to talk about, motivating people to do apprenticeships. Because you get business experience, like you get real life experience. You can decide if you actually really want to be in that place and you get a degree or a qualification at the same time. So you become so valuable to anywhere you want to go. Because I'm not tied into State Rolls Royce. After the four years, after my education finishes on the contract, it says that I can work wherever I want to work. So it's not, and that's how most apprenticeships work. They won't say that you have to work for them because then you're kind of selling away like your, your like freedom. You're kind of selling yourself to that place to work there. But at the end of that four years or three years or two years, however long the apprenticeship is, you can then say you've got all that experience and literally anyone will take you on. So I don't really know, that's my story. And then I went back, the most satisfying thing for me was probably going back to the girls' school and going back to Clapton, because I had to go back to get my certificates and like to get, I don't know, a signature of something, like some documents, because Rolls Royce are really weird about all these things. So I had to go to Sheffield High and the look on the teacher's face, <laughs> they're like, oh yeah, we've got an alumni system, like can we put you down for the alumni, like you can come in and talk to us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Clapton was the same, like, they were like, you really turned, you turned it around for yourself. And I was like, yeah, but honestly, I just think, Find something that you're passionate about mm -hmm. and just stick at it because no one, no one can tell you what you can't do. Like, you can do whatever you want to do as long as you put your mind to it and like really, really believe in it and manifest it. Like, if you want something, just tell yourself that you're going to be at that stage and that you will have that because that's what I did. <laughs> I was like, I will get this apprenticeship even though everyone was like, Mm, 40,000 people, don't be, like even there was a guy that I was texting from Rolls Royce, he was like one of the people that I did my placement with, and I remember texting him and being like, yeah, I've applied, like, I've, I've applied for the thing, and he was like, there's a lot of applicants, and I'm like, okay, I've got through to the next stage, and he's like, yeah, but there's still a lot of applicants, because they filter it down, because you have the online test, you have the, you have like two presentations that you've got to give, you've got a different interview, and then there's, assessment day center thing when you come in and you have to like do these tasks so there's uh, obviously it's 40,000 people they've got a way to filter it all down but the way that people will say to you oh like don't worry if you fail like you need to tell yourself that your mindset is that you're only going to win so even if you do fail you're still going to win I don't know how to explain it but like you've got to have that mindset where you're not going to let anything set you back and even though I did fail my first year at Tapton and everyone was like what is she going to do now? Like, yeah. not, I don't know what you're doing. You go straight A to our student, and now you're doing this. You can really change things. Like, there's not, it's never too late to sit down and be like, this is what I actually want to do, mm -hmm. and I'm going to do it. And people won't understand. Like, everyone's like, apprenticeship, this, this, this. Like, but now they're like, wow, you do that. So you need to decide what you want to do, become passionate about it, motivate yourself, and just do it. And everyone else, can be there when you're successful. Yeah. And they'll all want to meet you and they'll all be like, can you come do this, can you come do that? Mm -hmm. And then you can turn around and be like, I worked hard for it and you'll feel part of it. You can tell them no. Exactly. Yeah. Like, no. no, I would go back. No. I'd go back and be, because I think it's so satisfying. Yes. So satisfying. Yes. Like you're stood there motivating their students when they told you that you could do it. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah. Fail. I would yeah. do the same, honestly. Yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah, that's my song. So on like this, on a, on a finishing point, what advice would you give these girls today? What do you want them to do that? To find your passion, which all of you seem to have found. And with your passion, I feel like just branch out and just look at all the different opportunities that there are actually like within that section, because there's normally a lot of things that you can do and experience, experience, experience. Like I know it's a bit difficult with the whole COVID thing, but even things like this, like, speaking or like going to events or like joining courses and like doing different things meeting different people networking is so important it's all so important and if you put your mind to it you can do it Oh my gosh, so, so, so inspiring. I actually did not know half of the things that you just said. I know you for how long. So that was honestly amazing. And just to that, another point to add on what you're talking about failure and stuff, Thomas Edison, famous scientist, he, one of his like famous quotes that he says, 
He says, I never failed. I just found a thousand things that didn't work. And that's the perspective we have to say, okay, cool, it didn't really work out for me, but that just means I'm still looking for that one thing, that one thing that is right for me. So I hope you guys have found this day inspiring. I hope you guys feel more empowered. The next event and the last event is, again is on Saturday. 